So all I want to do for the next half an hour or, or so um, is explain really wh what Sputnik is. That's the plan. And I want to ask two questions. Why? Why bother uh, with Sputnik? Why is it that um, agents are saying, look, this is really important in Catalyst. We're, we're doing this. Why is my church paying me money to do this sort of stuff? Why? Why the arts? And why Sputnik particularly? And then to finish, what exactly does Sputnik do and how can we serve you guys in that if you'd like to? Okay, so that's really just simply uh, what I'd like to explain. And uh, so as regards to the why question, kind of vision of Sputnik, I suppose, I think I, I could probably uh, set it up like this. And it's a phrase that um, I think Jane used a minute ago. For, for some people, they would see art as the window dressing of life. OK, it's kind of beautifies, it makes pretty, uh, but it's fairly peripheral and it's in the background. OK, and as Jane pointed out, that is true. That is what some art does. But that is not what excites me about art. And I'm not we're not going to have a chin stroking session of what is art? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm not saying this is what art is. I'm just saying this is what excites me about art. It's not the window dressing side of things is uh, I think art is one of the most powerful communication tools to speak into the minds of a culture. Culture. I think art is, is the way, in many ways, one of the key ways in which culture is formed and shaped. And that really excites me uh, about art itself, okay, rather than just, oh, that looks nice or that sounds pretty or anything like that. And so the Sputnik slogan is because thought shapes art and art shapes life. It's quite catchy, that. If I say so myself. Anyway, because thought shapes art and art shapes life. And to explain this, I've got an, an image uh, that I often use. It's nicked off a guy called Francis Schaeffer, I think, although I can't find it in any of his books anymore. So maybe it's not. But if you like it, it's Francis Schaeffer. If you don't, it's my embellishments are wrong. So there you go. Okay. But imagine a big staircase, okay? However you want to imagine it, it's got to have stairs on it, okay? At the top of the stairs, imagine that there lives all of the brainiac sort of people, the academics, the uh, men and women who write the dusty books, okay? I was going to say the, with their beards, but obviously I've included women, so they probably don't have beards. But the men would probably have beards. So we've got academics at the top of the stairs. We've got them uh, sitting in their universities, uh, discussing, debating, but making these tomes. You're uh, John Paul Sartre's and your other philosophers and your sociologists and even your theologians. But the, those guys, okay, they're at the top of the stairs. Okay, right, go down the bottom of the stairs. The bottom of the stairs, you have the throbbing mass of humanity, okay? The plebs. Right, I'm not a politician, I can say stuff like that. It's all right, and I'm including myself in that. So they're at the bottom of the stairs. Now, whether you like it or not, and whether you think about academia, it is un undoubted, undoubted that those ideas at the top of the stairs that are discussed in universities and all that stuff affect and shape the thinking of your general populace, okay? It just happens, that's, that's how it works. Those books, although uh, are passed around kind of the, the, the corridors of academia, largely most of it written in Latin with those little numbers on that no one knows really what they mean, okay? Uh, those ideas have shaped the people down at the bottom of the stairs, okay? Now, the question though must be this, how, how does that happen? Because what's not happening, two things are not happening. The academics are not coming down the stairs generally to the general people. They write with little numbers and in Latin and all that sort of stuff, generally, and are writing for each other, okay? So they're not coming down the stairs. The people are not going up the stairs. People are not going to the library, like, badgering the librarian. I want my copy of Being and Nothingness, and I want it now, or Nietzsche's Will to Power, give it to me. People aren't doing that. They just, we don't do that. The, the academics aren't coming down the stairs. The people aren't going up the stairs. So how is it that society is so shaped by the big ideas, these big worldviews that are shaped uh, by these academics? Well, I think what it is, is that there's a third group of people that exist, and they live in the middle of the stairs. And what these people do is they take on the big ideas from the top of the stairs, uh, these big worldview things, and they kind of, uh, whether they're at an academic level they can do that, or just simply they understand how those things work, they take those things on, and then they hand them down in a palatable form to communicate clearly to the plebs at the bottom of the stairs. Any ideas who those people might be in the middle of the stairs? Filmmakers. Fil filmmakers, yeah. Anyone else? Stephen Moffat, ah yes, yeah, Stephen Moffat might come on to one of his compatriots in a minute. Uh, it's the artists, all, I think all of all artists would have a part to play in that way. The artists live in the middle of the stairs and what they do is they hand the ideas from the top down to the bottom. And actually, art has a power to take big ideas 
and powerfully communicate them to people who otherwise never to engage them in two ways, okay? And I think it does it in quite a normal communication way and it does it in a special art way, which I don't think anything else does. And so what a piece of art will do, it will communicate to your brain, okay? There is content to a piece of art, some art more obvious than others. So a song would have a, some ideas in it, some body of words, being a rapper, what's great about it is you've got more space to write lots of words than any other thing. So you can actually explain things quite clearly. And so at the end of the song, they go, this has hit my brain, you've communicated an idea, do I agree or disagree? So you're communicating information. And that would be in most art forms, actually. Uh, there would be content, okay? That's, but everything's communicated in that way. What art does as well as that, not instead, but as well as, while it sometimes gets your brain, sometimes it misses the brain out entirely and just hits you straight in your feelings and in your heart subconsciously uh, warming you to ideas that you don't necessarily even agree with or vice versa okay so you might have been in a situation where there's a preacher preaching a sermon and laying out kind of the car culture thinks like this and you're thinking yeah actually yeah I think like that and then the preacher comes with the sucker punch and goes however this is utterly against what Jesus thinks Jesus thinks this and you go oh wow of course I never thought of that before why had I thought that actually often our minds are shaped without us actually engaging rationally with those ideas and art often functions like that oh it just it feels like that's a good idea I've not even thought about it and art does both of those things and in that sense it's uh, it's very powerful as a tool of communication I've got two examples for you as I roll my cello tape onto the floor. And the first is from everyone's ta- favourite uh, late night uh, sci-fi, well not late night, mid, mid, mid-afternoon mid sci-fi show, Doctor Who. Okay, anyone own up to me a Doctor Who fan? Okay, we've got one, got two, <laughs> any more? Come forward. Um, so there's obviously some, there's, you guys are honest, there's obviously some who say, I'm looking around, I don't know if I can own up for that. But um, Doctor Who, um, I was watching an episode a while ago, I dabble, I'm not massive, you know, I dabble in Doctor Who. And uh, this, this plot was this, this is a slave girl and the doctor and her assistant have to save the slave girl who's about to be sacrificed to the old god. That's the name of this deity on this planet and they save her. Now obviously the old god doesn't turn out to be a god of any sort. It's a parasitic alien, which was a massive surprise to me <laughs> in the plot. But that's how it went, okay? Now as I was watching it, I kind of thought, okay, that's interesting. What's going on here then? What's the ideas here? And then I realised, this is familiar. They, they do this a lot, don't they, on Doctor Who? Whenever worship enters the arena, or God, instantly it's one of two things involved. Either complete naivety and stupidity, you're, you're worshiping something that's not there, okay? Or something much more sinister is going on. It's, fun, it's control and, and that sort of thing. I thought, wait, that's odd. That's happening. And also, I know another thing. That's exactly how people I meet think, isn't it? People say, well, you, can I get a look? I'm a Christian. They go, oh, right. And it's like, uh, it's kind of like, they sometimes even walk, kind of say, oh, that's nice. And what they mean is, oh, how silly of you. <laughs> like, you believe something that's just not there. It's naive. Or, I hate organised religion. It's about control. People will say that to you. And it's exactly the same things. Now, what's going on there? I actually don't think that what actually Doctor Who's doing is reflecting, just reflecting our society. I don't think it's doing that. I don't think that's accidental. It's completely deliberate. And I'll tell you what I mean. I know it's deliberate. Uh, Russell T. Davis is the man who resurrected Doctor Who uh, in 2005. Those of us who might remember these things, back in the day, years ago, I think it was either Sylvester McCoy or Peter Davidson put the last, uh, almost the last nail in the coffin of Doctor Who. And then they left enough time to forget about them. And Christopher Eccleston returned. 2005, do you remember this? I'm kind of getting quite in depth for Doctor Who. I, I'm, I dabble. I'm not that into it. I've done my research. Anyway, um, Russ T. Davis was the man who resurrected the show, executive producer, regular writer, and an atheist. In fact, quite an outspoken atheist. I'll quote from Russ T. Davis. Amazing quote. Amazing quote. He said this uh, in an interview. Yes, I'm deeply atheist. If they haven't reached that point by the year five billion, then I give up. When did the Doctor do that speech about believing in things that are invisible? It's episode five, isn't it? That's another bit of atheism chucked in. Now listen to this bit. That's what I believe, so that's what you're going to get. Tough, really. To get rid of those so-called agendas, you've got to get rid of me. That's his point. Read that bit again. That's what I believe, so that's what you're going to get. To get rid of those so-called agendas, you've got got to get rid of me. Come back to that amazing statement about art. Another interview, he wrote this. Uh, The only way I can write, whether that's good or bad, is to put my worldview into everything. I have to challenge that worldview from time to time, but in terms of the atheism of the show, I find that very powerful. What's happening here? Well, Russell T. Davis 
is taking an atheist worldview from the top of the stairs and skillfully using his art to communicate that to the hearts and minds of the people at the bottom of the stairs. And that, notice as well, I find this fascinating, how his agenda is so unagendered. He's not sitting at home thinking, how will I bring the demise of, of theism in the Western world? He's not being paid by Richard Dawkins to do this. He's simply saying, I have these beliefs and I'm going to make art. And of course I'm going to come through because that's what art does. It's authentic. Good art is authentic. It shows who you are. And so if you want to get rid of those agendas, you get rid of me because they're not really agendas at all. I'm just showing you who I am. And that's what he does. I think that's a great example of of the whole communication. Middle of the stairs, takes the top, brings it to the bottom. Give you another example. I think this is the, the, the biggest example uh, in our day and age. And, uh, and uh, it's an example that will come with a lot of different thoughts from different sides here. But I just want us to see this as a, a if we can, as a social phenomenon, with no kind of, with no, we're not going to the moral side of this today, but it's the cultural sh uh, shift regarding homosexuality uh, in our nation, okay? Uh, obviously, we would have strong opinions on that one way or another, however, I'll put the moral things to one side. Let's just what, look at it for what it is. It's an incredible, it's probably the largest social shift on a moral issue in the history, in a short period of time, in the history of this country, actually, on an issue like this. I'll give you an example. This might come as a shock to you. 1983, 32 years ago, a survey was done on attitudes to homosexuality in the UK. It found out that 66% of people surveyed said that uh, same-sex relationships were morally wrong. 66%, two-thirds of the population. Okay. It went down uh, into more specifics, though. More than half of those polled in 1983 said that it was unacceptable for a gay or lesbian person to become a school teacher. Okay, more than half the people in our country. Okay, 90% of people, 9 out of 10 people, said that it was wrong, it would be wrong for a gay or lesbian person to adopt a child. Okay, that's 32 years ago. That's not a long time. Okay, 32 years later, let's just say, I don't think we say a lot here, things have slightly changed from that position, I would imagine. And it's a huge, it's not a small thing, that, that doesn't happen all the time. That is absolutely massive. And I think we've got to ask this question, whatever our feelings are on that, how did that happen? What were the mechanics of that whole thing? Well, I'll tell you what didn't happen. People did not rush out in droves to study the mating habits of monkeys and look at biology reports and go and read Alfred Kinsey. That is not what happened. They didn't run up the, to the top of the stairs, okay? No, I can tell you how it happened. I might miss a few bits out, but this is how I think, it's how I remember it happening, okay? The 80s. What happened was you'd get in, in TV shows a few more sympathetic gay characters in the shows. Then what would happen is they would become more major characters in main, major programs like, say, uh, Friends or uh, soap operas or other major shows like that. Until the point where in the 90s you get shows uh, in TV like Will and Grace and The L Word where that became the, the main theme of the show. I don't even remember that sort of stuff. About that time, then broke back mountain. Uh, get get Ang Lee in uh, art house, directed with a bit of credibility. Comes in, broke back mountain, gets the main Oscar. In the world of music in the eighties, of course, I've been gay musicians since whenever. Uh, but in the eighties, they had to be a little bit more coded. So when uh, when Frankie goes to Hollywood, uh, brought out a single. I honestly thought it was telling me to chill out. I really did. I thought that's what that song was about. Apparently it wasn't about that at all. Um, <laughs> but there was a code involved. Then you fast forward to like the early 2000s and uh, Katy Perry's a little easier to decipher, isn't she? <laughs> she? She kissed a girl and apparently she liked him. Just so you know, she's a girl. Just so you know, got that? Just I've run that by you again. Okay, we got it. Okay, it all becomes much more uh, open and out there in all of those sort of genres. Christina Aguilera sung uh, You're Beautiful No Matter What They Say. In the background of the video, there are uh, two men kissing. There's uh, two ladies holding hands in a romantic uh, way. Until you get to the point late 2000, well, a couple of years ago, Macklemore can bring out the song, Chart Topping song, Same Love. Uh, which is just the whole thing is constructed as if you disagree that this is the same love as a heterosexual couple, well, there's no, you can't disagree, you're a monster, is the way the whole thing is constructed. Okay, now, I'm not making a moral judgment here, I'm just saying, as far as I remember, that's what happened. And it changed opinion, and it wasn't done through uh, legislation first, it wasn't done through academia first, it was done through the artist in the middle of the stairs handing ideas down to the bottom and completely changed the way our whole culture thought about sexuality. Thought shapes art and art shapes life. I told you I'll give you two examples, but I need to give you a third as well. Don't, don't know, I forgot this one. Um, so let's look now at the, art, the Christian artists who have significantly shaped our culture in that time. Thank you, Hugh. That proves my point nicely. Uh, 
for theological reasons that I completely understand, churches in the Reformed tradition, like ours particularly, in the recent past have decided to, one thing, they've decided Christian culture is totally good and secular culture is totally bad, okay? It's different today, but this is how it has been, okay? And therefore, uh, what we should do as Christians, a good Christian should retreat from secular culture, which is totally bad, and plow all our efforts into Christian culture, which is totally uh, good. It has lots of ramifications. So for example, in that model, full-time Christian ministry, well, you know what, that is that's the best of the best. It's not like being a, being a teacher or a doctor or something. That's nothing, okay, because the spirit of the church, that's good. That stuff's nonsense. Political involvement, well, unless you've got something to moan about, like uh, you've got some placards you can wave, just don't get involved with politics. It's out there, it's in the world. It's, the world is evil, it's passing away. No, the church culture is completely good. And uh, obviously, in art, it's just the same. And we've, a few people have intimated this. You, 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 I'm an artist, okay, well, if you can use, this has been the message said for many years, if you can use that gift in church, Brilliant, you know, fantastic. But don't do that. Hey, I'm in a band. Meet someone, I'm in a band. Oh, really? How old are you? Like, you're really in a band. You play in pubs. Okay, soon you'll be mature and you'll get rid of that stuff and you can lead a life group, honestly. <laughs> oh, we'll let you do that. You can aspire to that stuff, okay? <laughs> Christian culture, totally good. Secular culture, completely bad. And uh, you might think, oh, that's, that's interesting. I mean, what, little mistake. What's it done? Well, what it's done is this. It's completely removed Christians from the middle of the stairs. Christians, for whatever case, have removed themselves from the middle of the stairs and uh, the, our voice is gone. Is it any wonder, I think, why uh, our worldview is becoming so opposed to? You know what? It's not a problem at the top of the stairs. We've got some good guys and good girls at the top of the stairs. I'll tell you that for a start. People who can really answer the questions, who can really shape the worldview really well. Up at the top of the stairs is good. But whereas you say a, a Dawkins would have his Philip Pullman, who can then persuade the ideas, where's, where's N.T. Wright's Philip Pullman? Where is he? Where's his writer? It's not that Christians can't do it. Through the days, we've done this brilliantly. Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, Rembrandt, G.K. Chesterton, J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, fantastic in the middle of the stairs. They've all got something in common, though. They're all dead. <laughs> you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> Laughing at death. What we artists do when we get together. The vision of Sputnik is to encourage a new generation of Christian artists to take their place in the middle of the stairs. Simple as that. That's what we're about here. And that's why we exist. Now, I need to make two clarifications on that. Um, one may be slightly obvious and the other might be less obvious uh, in that whole thing. As I move to kind of well, what does that mean? How do you go around doing that? Uh, firstly, then, Sputnik is not primarily involved in worship art. OK, by worship art, I mean arts made by Christians for other Christians, particularly in a in a worship setting, okay? Now I need to be, follow that up even quicker than I tried to follow the last statement up with the statement this. I've got no problem with worship art. In fact, I'll go even further. I really like some of it. I've been blessed massively by uh, Christian songwriters of congregational worship. They help me in a congregational setting to engage with God, for which, which is a pretty important thing, and I'm really grateful for that. And some of you guys would be involved in that. And please, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying don't do it. I, I'm blessed by that stuff. I'm just saying that's not what we as a team are called to do, I don't think. That's not where we're going uh, with this sort of stuff. There's some people here who, gonna need to sh who really feel called to shake up how we worship in our churches or how we do uh, other art forms in our churches. I'd say, brilliant, fantastic, go with it. But we're not going to be so involved in that, really. We exist uh, for, to encourage artists to be excellent and to pursue their art outside of the church. I'd love to see a day, actually, where the models reset, whereby... Those who do that then are invited back in to recreate the church setting rather than what we've done up to now, which has been raised up the artists who do really well in church and go, hey, you're really good, heartbeat, you can go out there and be on, in the charts. Don't know if anyone remembers them. Delirious, a similar, uh, similar story, I, th I think. But actually it actually doesn't work like that. Because the church, everyone pats you on the back and says, you're brilliant, you're fantastic. We have very low standards around here on these things. <laughs> out, out you go, out you go to the wolves and let's see how you do. That's not a good way to do art. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so we're not primarily interested in worship art, although we like it and we think it's great and we'd love to see that explode in different ways, you know. Uh, secondly, and this might sound odd to you, we're not really that into evangelistic art either, which might sound slightly puzzling to you. 
because it sounds quite evangelistic so far, so I'll tell you what I mean. Obviously, everything I've said comes from a heart, an evangelistic heart. I would like the Christian worldview to be communicated more clearly so more people come to know Jesus. That's the essential bit, which is pretty evangelistic, I, I would imagine. Um, however, I think there's, there's a thing about evangelistic art which has become the sort of way of validating any artistic enterprise or anything that people uh, do. And uh, so by, by that I mean you do, a, you do a song, you'd have to mention Jesus every couple of lines, otherwise it's not really worth doing. You do a story where well, the main character has an interesting character art, but obviously the end's going to the same place. They stumble into the, the, the new service, the Christian service, and there's an interesting call from the man at the front, and they become a Christian at the end of the story, and that sort of thing. It's the, the whole gospel needs to be in every single thing um, in that sort of way. And the reason we're not necessarily into it that way is uh, for culture to be shaped by art, I think that art has to do two things. And firstly, as I've said, it needs to be addressed to the culture. Any art that's direct, directed to a very small subsection of that culture is unlikely to engage massively, especially if that subculture still already agrees with the worldview that's being said. Okay. But secondly, not just it has to be addressed to the culture, the art, and there's no two ways about this, the art has to be excellent. Otherwise, it will not be able to speak in that sort of way. Quality is vitally important, actually, here. Excellent art, though, is authentic art. It's honest. It's not things shoehorned in here and there. And it's also, there's a measure of subtlety involved. Now, I think for too long, people, Christians have only felt their art was valid if actually, like I said, the whole gospel is explained in everything. That's not excellent art. I'd argue that's not even art. It's advertising. That's what it's called. People are fed up of advertising. I'm fed up of advertising, I'll tell you that. I'm not saying that to have a go at anyone here. I've done loads of that stuff. I've done loads of advertising with, with some music in the background. But it's not going to shape the culture because it's not excellent art. If uh, you get nothing else from today, I just want to encourage anyone who's involved as a practitioner in art to just simply strip it right back. What do I do? What's my calling? Where shall I go from here? Two things is all you need to do. It's just two. And uh, they're very simple. One is love Jesus. There we go. I think we can do that. Love the Bible put sin to death in your life, filled with the Holy Spirit. It's why actually, it's not just that church needs you guys, we need church as well, because church helps us with that things in community with other believers, you know, for all that stuff. We love Jesus, number one. And secondly, we make stuff. So we do, number two. It's the only things we need to do. Be like Augustine said, uh, love Jesus and do what you want. I, I completely agree with that in the artistic arena. I'm not sure in every arena, but in art, I agree. Make art. Well, what? You mean make art about these deep theological truths? No, make art on whatever you want to make art about. Are you interested in something? Make something about it. Just something, something you see something in the news and it affects you. Well, do something about it. Make something on the back of it. Because actually, uh, if we're loving Jesus and full of the Spirit and we're making good art, it's going to show who we are. Jesus said we're a light. We are a light. The danger is not, Jesus didn't say, well, turn the dimmer switch up a bit. That's what we need to do. Or turn it on. No, he said you are the light. Just don't hide away under a bowl. No, well, I think the problem has been for Christians in many spheres, and in art particularly, well, we've hidden away under a bowl. We've, we've been, the church has been so busy, oh, we want you here. Well, actually, we've been hiding under a bowl. We need to be out there just simply loving Jesus and making stuff. Don't worry about the agendas. You are who you are. Like, like Russell T. Davis said, actually, no, no, that's what you'll get with me. Because good art shows your belief. It will show it as it goes through. So, practically then, just to finish, how... Do we go about this grand task of uh, <laughs> changing the whole thinking of our whole culture? Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, we've just got five. There are five things that we're doing at Sputnik at the moment um, that I hope in one way or another uh, you guys can get involved in or we can serve you in different ways. We'll continue uh, doing that, that. And the five things are, are these. There might be some others that appear over time. Firstly, we're going to do, we modelled this last year, we'll continue this this year and in the future, a annual uh, public exhibition, once a year, themed annual public exhibition. Now, um, but hand up if you were involved in the Kingdom Project last year, we did. There's a number of us, great, and a lot, number of you met through that. Really, thank you so much. Really, really, that was such great fun. Uh, we did a great job. We, we set this uh, topic Kingdom, we collected uh, visual art, we collected music, we also had the anthology on the side as well, uh, and then we did that at Catalyst. And then for a month in August in Birmingham, uh, we had uh, a whole chain of coffee shops in Birmingham, we put it up, the whole exhibition. So uh, about 10,000 people, 
got 15,000 food and festival to come through and engage with that conversation about kingdom, about authority, about uh, what Jesus' kingdom like with different stuff. It's it great, okay? And we're going to do that again this year. Uh, this time the, the anthology, the creative writing will also fit in uh, with the theme. And the theme is, what is it to be human? Um, and that's our theme, okay? So a little bit more just before we finish on that one. And the plan for that, and we've really kind of shifted it subtly and slightly, but Catalyst Festival is still going to, the stuff's going to be there. Anyone who submits anything will be in some form uh, shown at the Catalyst Festival or at least exhibit online during the Catalyst Festival, okay? So creative writing, music, uh, or visual art, okay? However, that's really a stepping stone to what I mainly interesting which is we've got a number of public exhibitions booked kind of but there's going to definitely one in Birmingham there's going to very almost definitely one in Coventry then there's going to be one in uh, another city could be Manchester could be London could be Newcastle not sure but there's going to be I think at least three there could be more um, because the whole point we want to get out there and the point of these exhibitions is to push uh, you guys and artists, particularly in the Catalyst Network of Churches, but actually, no, some of you aren't, and that's absolutely fine. We, we're not going to be picky and draw silly lines. We don't need to be silly lines, okay? Um, and it's to push you guys and give you a chance to get your work out there. That's important. Uh, but also hoping that over time, maybe this one, maybe ones to follow, uh, we can create something in the exhibitions themselves that will, can be significant, that can get people thinking about important questions and, and, and subtly drawing them towards Jesus as we do it. Okay, so that's the plan. So that's one thing we're going to do. And uh, what is it to be human? I'll mention it again just before the end. Uh, secondly, a smaller scale, but just as important. On the music side of things, we started the Sputnik Collective. Uh, it's in Birmingham. Where are, the, where are the guys? They're around here. So Rod's involved, Colin's involved, Andy's involved. Most of them have gone, actually. Too busy doing music and stuff, I don't know. Uh, Leanne and Amy are involved. Uh, there's some other people I've forgotten who will be devastatingly offended with me. But that's what makes it fun. I learned that from I learned that from Adrian Short. You can offend artists, can't you? Just treat them. Oh no, it's brittle. I remember vulnerable. Okay, yeah, definitely. Mantis involved, and there's some others. Joel is involved. Good. Anyway, there's a few of us, mainly Birmingham-based, because actually it's important to get together in this sort of sense. Anna's involved. Phew, I made it. Magnificent. Whew, that was real close. Um, and we have a terminally music event in Birmingham City Centre uh, where the point is to move the uh, move the musicians and songwriters a little bit out of their their comfort zones. Not wanting to sound a little. Bit of X factor there, but um, doing things they're not too comfortable with, I suppose, in one way or another, uh, and also just finding an interesting musical event where we can, in the process leading up to it, uh, get together, encourage each other, and work on how to collaborate. We are the guys I've just mentioned couldn't be any more different as regards musical styles, but Rob, we, we're kind of getting there, aren't we? We're making we had some we've had some fun anyway. So uh, so that's the Sputnik Collective, and that's in Birmingham. And we'd like that to be a prototype. We'd like to wrestle with that idea. How's that one prototype that and have it elsewhere that's the plan okay and if you live around here you can probably get involved which is cool and third thing and Hugh's mentioned it already similar thing uh, Catalyst Writers Group great to meet Hugh last year fantastic hearing from you earlier Hugh um, uh, Hugh's started up the Catalyst Writers Group there's about 11 of us and we're learning how to do iambic pentameter at the moment it's uh, We'll, I'll find out whether it's any uh, I've learned how to do it. I don't think I have. Anyway, um, and then we're going to challenge ourselves on that. And the idea again, prototype. That group is closed group. We don't want to have too many people, but we want to do that again and again to encourage writers, okay, in, in, that, sort of, uh, in that sort of way. Uh, so that's Catalyst Writers Group. Fourthly, uh, is things like this. We'd like to, this is the first one. Delighted you guys to come out today. O honestly, like, you know, as you were chatting ages ago, said, oh, this is a good idea. I thought, oh, how, how many people will come? I mean, you know, like giving up a whole Saturday for something. Amazing. And like I said earlier, I didn't even say anything of what we were doing until about two, three days ago. Okay, thank you so much. We'd love, if this is scratch where you're itching, we'd love to do more of these. That's absolutely fine. Because networking, I think, is vital uh, with things. And just getting on, you could, you could forget everything that's been said from this holy circle, wherever it is here. And still, this could have been very valuable. If you met someone who you can, yeah, I click with them. They can, I can support them. They can support me. Maybe we can work together on this. I think for... Uh, not too long on the side, but um, many people see church and art as like a problem mix. I can't, I can see, I can see why that is, but I, I can't help seeing that the opposite is true in that church is an artistic collective waiting to happen. That's what it is. Most artistic projects flounder through lack of collaboration and networking. And that could be through encouragement, just people who are together, individual projects, but you've got people like you who help you, okay, that's 
artistic movements that influence have those things that are going on. It could be people actually physically working together. Take the example of a, a big artistic project like a film, for example. Joel made a brilliant film, showed it at Catalyst last year, a couple of years ago. I went along for one day. I did the catering, didn't I? Poisoned that guy, if I remember rightly. Big guy. It was pretty scary. But anyway, um, don't get me catering on a film. The thing I learned, apart from don't cater the biggest guy in the film, okay, was how many people are involved. I had a guy stay at my house from Germany who made medieval instruments. That's it. There's a girl from New Zealand who made costumes. There was someone who took pictures to do the continuity in the film. Lighting. Now, for most people, they can't do something like that, however good their ideas are or anything like that, because to get that number of people costs an absolute fortune. However... If churches, if, this, if we can get this right, you could suddenly go, well, actually, that's a good idea, and I've, we've got them all. Here they are. Let's have, if you from Edinburgh, do this. You from here, do this. And that's not, that's not, I don't think that's fantasy. I think that's reality. If we can get this right and we can be, uh, attract more artists and be motivating what we're doing, we can punch above, well above our weight, saying nothing about how good we are as artists by, by networking, by collaborating. So we want to network more. That's important in itself. Okay, and we can do more of that. And the fifth thing that Adrian said, and this is more invisible to most of you guys, but we are working, and it's on the agenda of talking with church leaders. Okay, and just opening up that discussion and how that we don't know how that looks, but there is a. I'd say this honestly, there is a real feeling uh, within uh, within our network of churches that people are saying, "Look, there's something here. We, we we might not all get this, but we see God's on this, and there's something here, and we want to know how to to pastor people better. We want to know how to send people out better. We want to know how to do this better, and we are going about that stuff. Okay, uh, so just you might not see all of that. But there is conversations going on and we want to do that as well. We, we want to develop the, this is a side, we want to develop the performing arts wing of things if that's the way that we can go. We know this dance and dramatic kind of arts are not here represented Sputnik uh, in what we do at all. They are represented out there. Um, and if that's something people can get involved in, brilliant. Love that. It's not there because we don't want it. It's just not there because we haven't got there yet. Um, but that's basically that. That's where we're at with Sputnik. That's the why and the what. I don't know if I had a how. Maybe I had a how as well. But, you know. Same sort of thing.